Matthew 5, verse 8 is our focus. There our Lord is preaching on the side of the hill, and he says in verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This verse is probably one of the most challenging of the Beatitudes. Uh, when I read this verse, uh, there's some questions that immediately pop in my mind. And I don't think the verse is challenging because of the last part, that they shall see God. But for the first part, blessed are the pure in heart. Now the sure promises of God to those in his kingdom. This is what we've been seeing week in and week out on that second part of the beatitude. Those promises that the kingdom belongs to us. That we will be comforted. That we will inherit the land. That we will be satisfied. That we will receive mercy. And hear that we will see God. These are promises that await us. But these are also promises that we have right now. We possess this even now, even though not fully realized. Well, when we look at the first parts of these Beatitudes, in particular today, we can buy into these, I think, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. We can get behind those and believe that because the Lord has done a work in us. And we know this in our soul. We've all experienced this. But then when we come to here where it says, Blessed are the pure in heart. That might be difficult for us to process. And why is it so difficult for us to process? Because every person in this room knows that we are not pure in heart. Oh, we mourn over our sin. And yes, we've been spiritually bankrupt and come into salvation. And we can exercise meekness where we don't bring vengeance on others. But to be pure in heart, we know ourselves. We know this isn't the case. We know that we have impurity in our hearts. We can fool one another. We don't fool ourselves. And we certainly don't fool God in this. My heart is far from pure. Your heart likewise is far from being pure. And yet Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart. And so we ask, how can I be pure? The simple answer is through salvation, through Jesus Christ, whereby he takes the sinner and he declares him righteous and he imputes, he gives to his account his own righteousness. The indebted sinner who needs righteousness has that place to his account by Christ. And so that's the simple answer. How can I be pure? But feeling disgust over my sins and mourning over them is one thing. But being pure in heart and not committing sins again is another. Imagine listening to Christ teaching this. Those people are standing there on the hillside and they are hearing these words. And if they're good little Jewish students... They would understand what God has said concerning man's purity. If they've grown up in Judaism, they know what the Bible says when it comes to cleanliness of the soul. And even if they're Gentiles listen to this, they have their own life experience that tells them, my heart is not always pure. Well, Isaiah, the prophet of God, a prophet of God said this about himself in Isaiah 6. I'm a man of unclean lips. Later in chapter 64, he says, All of our righteousness is like filthy rags. The prophet Jeremiah asks, Why do people remain unclean? In chapter 13, verse 27 of his oracle, 
And then the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 24, 13 chastises the people for not being clean and being found in filthiness again. Well, King Solomon, he writes to this point, he says, the proud one is not washed from his filthiness in Proverbs 30. And even later in the book of Revelation, John on that last day, on the day when the kingdom is finally ushered in completely and fully, when the sheep and the goats are separated, he says that there is one who remains filthy. Man is unclean. We are soiled, we are spotted, we are polluted, we are stained before God. And where does man's inherent filthiness come from? Where does this impurity come from? Well, according from, to Jesus in Matthew 15, 18, he says, all uncleanness proceeds from the heart. All of our filthiness comes from the heart. And Jesus said to Peter and the other disciples, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. It's not an external problem we have. It's a heart problem. This is where our filth emanates from. This is where it comes from. This is the the reason that King David in Psalm 51.10 says, Lord, create in me a clean heart. A man after God's own heart, praying to have a clean heart in him. The church reformer Martin Luther, he had some serious and dangerous dealings with Rome, with its popes, with its cardinals and bishops. He sought to reform the Roman Catholic Church in his day, and he sought to reform the papacy, the place where the Pope reigns and sits on high. For his work, for his Reformation work, he was excommunicated from the church at Rome. He was thought of as a criminal. He was excommunicated, and his life was threatened daily. However, Luther famously had these words to say when it came to what he feared most. It wasn't the papacy. It wasn't the cardinals. It wasn't the bishops. It wasn't even their loyal followers from town to town. He said this, I am more afraid of my own heart than I am the pope and his cardinals. For I have within me a great pope, self. He feared his heart. He understood what resided in him, this self, this selfishness, the defilement that comes from self. So when Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, this would have jolted the crowd. It's not that they hadn't ever heard this before, but to hear it in this context, it startles them. Just like it startled the writers of the scripture. They knew. Just like you hear from post-biblical times like Luther. They knew the heart. They understood that they were unclean. For none of us are pure in heart. Well, I have two questions. First, what is the heart? And second, how can it become pure? First, what is the heart? Well, Jesus is not referring to that blood-pumping organ that we all have when he's referring to the heart. He's referring to something much deeper, much more seated in us. He's referring to the thing that makes you, you. He's referring to the soul of a man, 
This is where the heart resides in the soul, for men are body and soul. The heart always begins with the mind. That which comes out of our heart, which comes out in us, starts in the mind. It's that fountain where we find all of our thoughts, passions, desires, appetites, affections, and will. The heart is that part that is the deep down in your guts part of you, the place where we think, feel, and act. Now we intrinsically understand this idea. We have sayings like, I will love you with all of my heart. Such a statement understands the sentiment of the heart. Solomon warns of watching over the heart in Proverbs 4.23. He says, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it spring or flow the issues of life. He's warning, watch your heart, guard your heart, for out of it flows, for out of it gushes like a spring your deepest longings and your deepest desires. Now second, how can a heart become pure? Well, quickly before I answer the how, I want to define what Jesus means by the word, the word pure. Pure means free from every mixture of anything else or anything false. It's free of what is impure, of what is blended. To be pure in the ancient Greek world referred to the dross, the impurity that is found in gold. It referred to that being separated out, that which is mixed with the gold. It referred to the husk that was around wheat, the chaff. The chaff is impure, the kernel is pure, and those are separated. Those must be divided out for purity to come to place. Well, one commentator said that the basic understanding of pure, purity, is this. It is one of integrity or of singleness of heart. It's opposed to duplicity. It's opposed to that double heart. It's opposed to a divided heart. Purity is that unmixed motive of single-mindedness, undivided devotion with the absence of of double-mindedness. Remember that. It's the absence of double-mindedness. It's a single-minded attitude. The prophet Jeremiah, in chapter 32 of his prophecy, he illustrates this point of what purity is and how it's when it's mingled with impurities, how harmful that can be. Verse 39 of that chapter, God is speaking to his duplicitous people, to his people that are divided in their heart. And he says, I will give them one heart, and I will give them one way. See, God is showing them that their hearts are not single minded in their devotion, but they are double minded, in fact, when it comes to God. And so he says, I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me always. I think it's important that we recognize the double-mindedness of our heart because that is what we feel. That is the tension when I stand up here and I say, blessed are the pure in heart because we know we're not. How can the heart become pure is the answer. That's the the question. How do we answer? How does the heart become pure? Well, there's only way for a, a heart to become pure. Only one way. That's faith in Jesus Christ. In Acts 15, there's a dispute between the church elders and the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are saying that for the Gentiles to come into the church, they must come underneath the law of Moses, the law of circumcision. And so, like the Pharisees do, 
Though they're zealous in their works, they're wrong in their works, and they're pushing a false doctrine. And so this dispute arises, and the apostles come together with the elders of the church to answer this question. And so Peter, the apostle, he stands up and he says to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days that God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them. He made no distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles, having cleansed their hearts by faith. You see, it's not about circumcision that that brings you into the kingdom. To be circumcised is nothing. It is merely an external work of the flesh. But faith, this is what cleanses hearts. This is how one becomes pure. In the prophecy of Ezekiel, chapter 35, there we have the great promise of the new covenant that will come. There Ezekiel is telling God's people that he will give them a new heart. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart. And a new spirit. And I will put within you my spirit. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. And give you a heart of flesh. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes. And to obey my ways. Ezekiel is telling of this greater covenant. This better covenant that is to come. And it is found in Jesus Christ. It is the purification that comes from faith alone in Jesus Christ. And so I would say, thus far we could say, the verse repeats, happy and content are those who are made pure in heart. For in salvation you are made pure in heart. Blessed are you, content are you, joyous are you, for you shall see God, is how I would say it. Now let me just say a quick word about seeing God. Now remember, Jesus is talking about his kingdom. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven that is being ushered in. So he's using this kingly talk. In the ancient world, the only way that you could come before a king, the only way that you could see a king face to face is if he summoned you. If he called you and invited you. This is the only way that you could see a king. It, to, to come by any other means meant death. So when Jesus says a pure in heart will see God, this is unbelievable news because nobody saw the king in those days. For the emperor thought he was God. And if you went before him without imitation, you died. So this assurance that you will see God to those who are pure in heart, this knowledge, it delights them. This knowledge of knowing that the king is pleased to see me, it would have excited them. It would also have overwhelmed them just knowing the audience and its makeup. Yet I cannot shake the knowledge of knowing this. That I have a wandering and impure heart. Just like those people. There was a pastor named Albert Moeller who helped me think through this. So these thoughts are his. They're not original with me. But I want to be very practical with you when it comes to this section. I want you to listen closely. I do not always have a pure heart. But as a pastor, you would think that I should have one. But sometimes when I preach, I'm hungry. And I think about that, and my heart's divided. Sometimes when I preach, people are asleep. 
and it discourages me, and I think about that. And sometimes I see people when I'm standing up here that have upset me, that I'm mad at, and I think about that. My heart is being mixed with an impurity. My heart is not single-minded, it is double-minded. But you think, as a pastor, I should always have a pure heart. I should always be focused on preaching. I should be focused on shepherding. But I'm here to tell you that I'm not. Now listen, sometimes I don't want to preach to you. Sometimes I'm weary and I'm frustrated. And sometimes I'm just flat out worn out by shepherding. But you want to know something else? I know that you don't always want to be here. I know that you don't always want to hear me preach. I know you don't always come to worship God. I know your minds wander during worship. You have hungry tummies too. I know sometimes you come in here and you avoid people that you don't like. And I know sometimes you sit in your assigned chair, self-assigned chair, sitting there being mad and angry because somebody won't come up and talk to you. Like me, you have impure hearts. You don't always want to come to church. You might have a bad attitude when you come here. You might be sad. You might be lonely. You might be angry. You might be bitter. You might be just disengaged from it all. Double-mindedness. You don't have a single-minded devotion to the Lord. Impure. Well, why is this the case? Well, because we don't watch over our hearts and it becomes double-minded because it doesn't act in faith. James says the man who won't ask God in wisdom and in faith when going through trial, when that man goes to God and asks him in a faithless way, that he is double-minded and unstable in all of his ways. One pastor comments on this passage of this double-mindedness in our hearts. A double-minded person is restless and confused in his thoughts. His actions and his behavior are confused. Such a person is always in conflict with himself. One torn by such inner conflict can never learn with confidence on God or his gracious promises. Furthermore, he says, the term unstable, it's analogous to a drunken man unable to walk a straight line. He is a drunk. He is swaying one way, then another. He has no defined direction and as a result doesn't get anywhere. And such a person like this is unstable in all of his ways. We know this because Jesus draws it out in Matthew 6, 24. We think about money in the passage. For man cannot serve two masters. For either he'll hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And we think of that just in the context of money. But he's getting to this understanding of the heart. The heart that is divided. The heart that wants to serve two masters ends up serving no master. It's only a heart that runs amok. It's only a heart that is unstable and gets nowhere. Because our thoughts, actions, and behaviors are like a drunk man's when we do not operate it in a single-minded, unmixed purity. Our double-mindedness only breeds impurity. So what do we do then? 
How do we practically be pure in heart when we've already been positionally made pure in heart? I hope you know what I mean by that. There's the practical side of our Christian walk that springs out of positional side. We have been declared righteous. We have Christ's imputed righteousness. We are gods. We will see God. But we all sit here knowing we don't have pure hearts. So how can this be? What do we do? Well, the first thing we must do is be like King David. And we need to ask God to create us, create in us a clean heart. Pray. This is Christianity 101. Pray. Uh, no duh, Troy. We pray. But the very act of second-guessing God, of knowing I should go to God and say, God, create in me a clean heart, but not really believe that he will, is double-minded. It's impure. There's no faith involved there when I go and I pray. If I do not pray in faith, if I'm not praying in a single-minded devotion, it's impurity. Secondly, we must transform our hearts by reading the pure word. We heard Carl talk about this in his prayer. Another, well, yeah, duh, we know that, Troy. We're to read the Bible. We're to meditate on the scriptures. Psalm 119.9 says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. Again, if we don't approach the Bible in faith, if there's doubt in our mind, if we suspect that God will not guard our way and keep us pure, because we know, we just simply know we're supposed to do this, then we're impure and double-minded and unstable in our ways. But thirdly, let me give you a strange sounding piece of advice. This is going to sound strange. Bear with me. Martin Luther once said, sin boldly when maintaining your purity. Sin boldly. That ought to strike you in a certain way. No, he's not saying sin up a storm. He's not saying sin and sin and sin so that God's grace may abound more and more and more. No, he is not saying that. What he meant is this. There's no way to avoid sinning in your duties. We come to church. We're to worship. We're to pray. Or to read the Bible, the Christian duties. There's no way to avoid sinning in your duties because we are sinners. There is no way to have perfection when I preach. There is no way for you to have perfection when you worship. There is no way to have perfections in our relationships due to the fact that we still have an indwelling sin, but still. But still, in spite of this, you will see God. But rather, to sin boldly means to go and perform your duty anyways. Go and perform your duties despite your sin because God has commanded it so. Another way to say it is like this. Boldly do your Christian duty, even though you may sin in the course of that duty. Boldly go and do your Christian duty, even though you may sin in the course of that duty. Why? Because it's not impure and sinful to preach or to worship, but it is sin not to preach, and it is sin not to worship. Therefore, 
sin boldly. That is his point. If I were to summarize verse 8 of Matthew, I would write it like this. This is my summary statement of this one little verse. Joyful and content are the ones made pure in heart, who practice purity of the heart, since they will be seen by the king. That is my synopsis of what is taking place here. Blessed are the pure in heart, because we've been made pure, for we will see God. Amen? Pray with me.